Welcome to the basics of animal development module. In this module, we're going to learn about various aspects of animal development. In this talk, we'll look at the stages of animal development. So we're going to look at the description of different stages, as well as learn about different body axes and planes. Development is associated with multicellular organisms that undergo sexual reproduction. Now during sexual reproduction, haploid gametes are formed, and these haploid gametes fuse to form a single-celled organism that is diploid, which is called as the zygote. So in the figure, we have the egg and the sperms, which are the haploid gametes, and they fuse, and that process is called fertilization, to form a single-celled organism that is diploid and called as a zygote. The zygote undergoes many rounds of cell divisions and a lot of changes to form a fully functional multicellular organism, which in this case is a frog. And so this process of going from the single cell zygote to the fully developed multicellular organism comes under the realm of development. Let us continue with the example of the frog and look at the different steps of animal development. So in a previous slide, we just looked at the fertilization step where the haploid gametes, namely the sperm and the oocyte or the egg, fuse to form a single cell zygote. This single cell zygote then undergoes the process called cleavage. And in this process, the zygote undergoes many rounds of cell division to ultimately form a structure called as a blastula. The blastula then undergoes the process of gastrulation. And in this process, cells that are of the blastula start migrating and will form the three germ layers, namely the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. Once gastrulation is complete, organogenesis occurs, and this is where the different organs of the organism are formed. Once the organs of the organism are formed, that is when the organism is ready to be born or it undergoes the process of hatching if it is in an egg. In the case of many animals like insects as well as amphibians, there is a stage where the organism that is born undergoes many changes called as metamorphosis and then only does it become a mature organism or adult organism that can now undergo sexual reproduction. This adult organism can now form gametes through the process of gametogenesis. The male organism will form the male gametes, which are called as the sperms, and the female organisms will form the female gametes, which are the eggs or the oocytes. These male and female gametes can undergo fusion in the process of fertilization and the whole process begins again. The first process that we're going to look at is the process of gametogenesis. Gametes are formed by the different sexes of the organisms and the two sexes that we are most familiar with are the males and females. The reproductive structures in sexually mature organisms form gametes through the cell division process of meiosis, and this entire process of forming gametes is called gametogenesis. As shown in the picture below, the females, they produce the female gametes, which is the egg, whereas males will make the male gametes, which are usually sperms. In both cases, the gametes are haploid because of the process of meiosis. To create a new organism, the fusion of gametes must occur, and this process is called fertilization. The zygote that is thus formed is now diploid because of the fusion of two haploid gametes. Once the zygote is formed, the zygote will undergo a series of mitotic divisions to form many cells that are called as blastomeres. 
it should be noted that the overall volume of the cell or the zygote does not change. So when we look at the picture below that is towards our left, here is one zygote that has undergone two cell divisions to form four cells. As we can see, there isn't a change in the overall volume. However, instead of one cell, we now have four cells. The process of cleavage occurs fairly rapidly. For example, in the fruit fly, Drosophila, 50,000 cells can be generated in a span of 12 hours. The resulting structure is a structure that is made up of thousands of blastomeres and is called as a blastula. And this is what we can see on the right side of the figure that is shown in the slide. Now the way cleavage happens is usually determined by the amount and distribution of yolk that is present in the cytoplasm of that fertilized zygote. Now it should be remembered that yolk actually inhibits the process of cleavage. Just to get an idea of what is yolk, yolk is actually made up of proteins and lipids. It should be remembered that in many types of eggs, yolk is very important because it is the nutrient for the growing embryo. In addition to yolk, there are other factors or proteins that can be present in the cytoplasm of that fertilized egg or zygote that can also influence the process of cleavage. In the case of eggs where there is yolk present, we can divide the egg into two different parts. The part of the egg where there is an abundance of the yolk is called as the vegetal pole. And if we look at the figure that is shown to the right, we can see in the blue box that the vegetal pole is right where the yolk is, towards the bottom. The opposite pole, on the other hand, where there is relatively low concentration of yolk, is called as the animal pole. And so it's important to know this terminology of which part of the egg is the vegetal pole and which part of the egg is the animal pole. Based on their yolk distribution, eggs can be classified into different groups. The first one is called as the isolecetal eggs, and in these eggs, a lot of times they have very less yolk, if not any, and the yolk that is present is equally distributed. Thus, they can have sparse yolk, and if they do have yolk, it will be equally distributed throughout the egg. Another type of egg are the mesolecetal eggs. They normally have moderate yolk that is also distributed throughout the cell. A third type of egg are the central lecithal eggs, and in these eggs, the yolk is present in the center of the cell, and there's usually quite a bunch of it. Teolecithal eggs are the ones that also have very dense yolk, but they normally are localized in a portion of the cell, as we can see in the figure below. The presence of yolk will actually inhibit cleavage. So zygotes that have sparse yolk, they undergo a type of cleavage called holoblastic cleavage. Holoblastic cleavage is shown in the top part of the figure. This is normally seen in isolecetal zygotes. So isolecetal zygotes are the ones that arise from isolecetal eggs which have very sparse, if any, yolk, and when it is present, it is evenly distributed. There are four different ways by which cleavage can occur, and it all depends on the planes at which cleavage occurs. The first one is the radial cleavage. Another one is a spiral cleavage. We can also have bilateral cleavage, and finally, rotational cleavage. Zygotes that arise from mesolecetal eggs, they normally show a displaced radial cleavage. When we look at zygotes that arise from eggs that have dense yolk, they cannot undergo holoblastic cleavage, and hence they undergo a different type of cleavage due to the presence of the yolk, which is called as the miroblastic cleavage. Miroblastic cleavage is an incomplete type of cleavage. T. 
telolecithal zygotes that arise from telolecithal eggs are the ones that have the dense yolk that's through, present throughout most of the cell. They tend to show two types of cleavages, either bilateral cleavage or discoidal cleavage. If we look at the figure that is shown in the red box here and compare it with the holoblastic cleavage, we can actually see that the zygote is not undergoing complete cell divisions, and hence the myroblastic cleavages are considered as incomplete cleavages. If a zygote arises from a central acetal egg where the, there is quite a lot of yolk but it's present at the center of the cell, then this cleavage process is a superficial cleavage. Once cleavage occurs, the next process that happens in embryonic development is gastrulation. Gastrulation occurs usually in the development of organisms in the animal kingdom. Plants and fungi do not show the process of gastrulation during their developmental processes. Gastrulation is the stage where the germ layers are formed. In the case of organisms like us, we have three germ layers, which are the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. These three germ layers will eventually provide the different parts of the body during the process of organogenesis. Gastrulation normally begins at a region that is 180 degrees opposite to the point of the sperm entry. A dimple-like structure is formed that's called as the blastopore. If we look at the figure to the right, the part that is shown in the white rectangle is the blastopore that is formed. The cells you tend to migrate to the interior through the blastopore to form what will eventually become the mesoderm and the endoderm. The cells that are present on the outside will form the ectoderm. And thus, through the process of cell migration, we can form the three germ layers of the ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. It is important to know the different types of ways in which the cells can migrate during gastrulation to form the germ layers. In this slide, we can see five different types of cell migration, and we'll begin with the process of invagination. In this process, we can see that there can be a sheet of cells that fold inward into the embryo, and such a movement is called as invagination. Another type of cell migration that can happen is called involution, and in this case, there is a turning in of a sheet of cells that were there in the outer layer to form an inner layer, and that is what is shown here in the figure where the red boxes are, because that is where we can see the turning in of the cell sheet. Another type of cell migration is ingression. And in this case, what happens is if we focus on the red box, there are cells that will actually leave the outer layer and migrate inwards. And this kind of a movement defines ingression. In some cases, what can happen is there can be a splitting or migration of one sheet of cells to form two sheets, as shown in the figure in the blue box. This is called delamination, and the portion of the figure that's in the red box actually shows how one sheet has formed into two sheets. The final cell migration that we will look at is called epiboly. In epiboly, it is actually a situation where a cell sheet expands to cover the inner cells and that is what is being shown here where we can see on both sides the outer sheet of cells that is in blue is moving downwards and spreading in order to cover the cells that are in shown in pink in the figure. Thus, it's important for all of you to know the different types of cell migrations that occur and you should be able to identify the different types of cell migrations that have been discussed in the slide. 
During the process of gastrulation, in addition to the germ layers, the embryos will also develop their body axis. There are three main body axes that we need to keep in mind and learn about. The first one is the anteroposterior axis. It basically allows us to differentiate the organism into the anterior end, which is the front part, and the posterior end, which is the rear part. The next axis is the dorsoventral axis. In this case, the dorsal is the upper part of the fish, while the ventral one is the part where the belly of the fish is. The third axis is the right-left axis. As we know in the case of our body, even though we have symmetric features like our eyes and our ears, we do have asymmetric features too. For example, our heart is to the left side of our body, while we have other kinds of organs that are tilted towards the right side of the body. And that's where the right-left axis comes into play. In addition to body axis, we also have body planes. The first body plane we're going to learn about is the lateral or horizontal plane that is shown in the picture as a dark blue line. This plane separates the body into the dorsal and the ventral plane. As shown in the figure, the lateral plane is going to change or separate the body into a dorsal and the ventral parts of the organism. The second plane we're going to look at is called as the transverse plane. The transverse plane separates the body into the interior and posterior parts as shown by the red boxes in the figure. The third plane is the sagittal plane. The sagittal plane is going to separate the body into right and left. Please remember to know about the various body axes and the body planes. After the process of gastrulation comes the process of organogenesis. Organogenesis is the process where the organs are actually formed. It begins with the formation of a structure called as the notochord. The dorsal mesoderm cells, they condense and form a rod of cells that is usually called as the notochord. The notochord cells will then signal the cells above it to become the future nervous system. During the process of development, a neural tube is formed and when the neural tube is formed, the embryo is called as a neurula. In the picture below, the part in the white box shows the formation of the neural tube. During the process of organogenesis, we also form structures called as somites that aid in the formation of different body parts. Organogenesis is when different organs start forming and we can start seeing the various shapes and structures of the organs. Once organogenesis is complete, the organism is ready to be born. So this is when you will have the hatchlings hatching from their eggs, or in the case of mammals, we will have the new baby being born. In the case of some organisms, there is a stage of metamorphosis, which is characterized by dramatic changes in the body to form an adult. Please note that not all organisms show metamorphosis. For example, humans do not show metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is normally observed in some invertebrates and amphibians. In the picture shown below, we can see the metamorphosis process of a frog where in A, we have a tadpole. In B, we can see the formation of the hind limbs and forelimbs of the tadpole. In C, we can now start seeing more distinct features of a frog. In D, we can see the tail of the tadpole becoming shorter and shorter to finally give us E, which is the mature frog. In the case of invertebrates, the best example is that of a butterfly. 
it basically starts its life as a caterpillar, which is a larvae. The caterpillar then feeds and then it forms a chrysalis and after going through metamorphosis, ultimately you end up with a butterfly. With this, we come to the end of the talk where we learned about the different stages of animal development as well as how to identify the body axis and planes.